morning, everybody, um, to wherever you are, whether you're in the UK, the Middle East, or in Africa, as I am. Uh, this is the first in a series of webinars that um, we will be hosting, and we'll be placing topical matters and leading industry lights under the spotlight. So um, I'd like to introduce today's guests. Um, and obviously, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have two esteemed legal practitioners um, from across the world uh, with us today. We first have David Brimmore Thomas, who's Queen's Counsel at 39. Essex in London, and he will be known to many people around the world um, because his work focuses on major international construction projects. Um, interestingly, David is an honorary professor in the Centre for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London, and he's a co-editor of the Global Arbitration Review Guide to Construction Arbitration. And that would be interesting because Global Arbitration Review has been at quite, quite at the forefront of all the issues over the last nine, nine months, most definitely. Um, so delighted to have David with us. Uh, we're also joined by Mr. Fernando Ortega, who is a partner and is the regional head of arbitration at the French law firm CVML. Um, Fernando's work is representing um, clients as counsel and advocate, and he works in commercial construction and investment arbitration. So he gives us a good flavour in terms of the overall commercial arbitration um, across the Middle East, Africa um, and South Asia. Um, so, gentlemen, without, without further ado, um, obviously we want to make the most of your time. Um, we've discussed together on a number of occasions um, and, and much has been made of the first phase of the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns that followed. Um, I, I just want to investigate today with you where we are now and what happens in the second or third waves of the lockdown. Um, for the last nine months, we've listened to many debates on force majeure, prevention, frustration, and we've listened from a whole range of jurisdictions, but it's, a, it's been an international flavour for everybody. Uh, but we now face the second phase and probably um, third phase of the effects that follow. Uh, one thing that we have learned with some certainty is that in the pre-COVID-19 um, period, the force majeure clauses in construction contracts didn't ordinarily include for pandemics. Now, I'm not saying they didn't include at all, but it wasn't the norm. Obviously, in the post-COVID-19 situation, we have force majeure clauses in construction contracts, which include for pandemics as part of the new norm. Um, and, f and for me, in my area of expertise, working in delay and quantum, obviously the issue of foreseeability um, is, is something that I'm always confronted with in terms of delay analysis um, and how I should approach things, both from a, a time and cost point of view. Um, the issue of foreseeability is, has almost seen a seismic shift um, when applied to the post-COVID-19 um, contracts, with many aspects of delay analysis, analysis in the post-COVID-19 contract being labelled almost for foreseeable all this extended time that we must now spend um, and whilst delay analysis has always faced a great deal of scrutiny uh, with the competing forms of analysis and the application of prospective and retrospective methods it's always been my position that the facts cannot be divorced from the contract and, and the general principle is that extension of contract clauses exist in construction contracts for the protection of both parties um, David if I if I may ask you um, probably a two-part question really, um, and it's probably a question that lots of our listeners want to, want to engage in really. Um, has the change to the force majeure provisions just placed a whole new set of unavoidable risks onto the contractor? And in, in terms of the COVID situation, what does that do for the elements of delay analysis? Is it, is it, is it, does it remain the, the issue that it was? Does it remain more difficult? Does it remain more po impossible? And, and obviously, what are the wider implications in arbitration as a whole? Um, Damien, first of all, thank you for inviting me to, to participate um, in this uh, webinar. Um, taking the questions uh, in the order that you put them, um, obviously, the force majeure provisions that we've seen in, 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 in major construction contracts. Um, the easiest one to take as the paradigm is the FIDIC Red Book. FIDIC Red Book defines an exceptional event rather than a force majeure event as being beyond a party's control. Party couldn't reasonably have provided against it before entering into the contract. Having arisen, the party couldn't reasonably have avoided or overcome it, and it's not substantially attributable to the other party. And as you say, a lot of old force majeure provisions didn't include pandemics. Um, the closest you come in the FIDIC Red Book is natural catastrophes such as earthquake, tsunami, volcanic activity, hurricane or typhoon, which are pretty physical natural catastrophes rather than biological ones. Um, but I think COVID, uh, the argument is that, that COVID falls within the uh, may comprise, but not limited to sort of rubric that you get in the, in the Red Book. One of the problems and the things that you're seeing argued is, is, is extending 
language expressly to include pandemic. Uh, some parties are saying, oh, well, if you need a, a, a specific list of, of, of events, clearly it wasn't included in the original language. So there's a bit of an argument around that uh, rubric. I think that the problem is going to be this. Um, extending force majeure or similar language to pandemics um, will work with future pandemics uh, that aren't anticipated. So if in 2025, um, COVID-25 comes along, um, we'll probably be there. We'll know what, how, how to respond. But the issue is going to be um, what happens with subsequent waves of COVID uh, as they arise, because um, in pre-COVID contracts, yes, the effects of first wave, second wave, third wave may be analyzed as, as, as exceptional events. But in contracts that have been entered into now, COVID is a known thing. And people are saying, we're going to be living with COVID for the next forever. It's just going to become endemic, if not pandemic. So that's going to be a problem. And I think the other issue, which is um, a, a, an issue, that the sort of problem that, that goes to your second question, um, has COVID now rendered elements of delay analysis impossible, is when COVID came along in March or April, um, we didn't know what was happening. People were, you know, I had clients from India who shut down literally in about 12 hours notice. Um, now, if there is a second wave and a third wave, uh, the delay analysis is going to have to tease out to what extent uh, in fact, could things have been modified or moderated uh, because of the sort of known things that we can now do in relation to isolating people, working remotely, uh, vaccinating, those sorts of issues which weren't available to us back in, or to people like you back in, um, back in March, April, May of this year. Uh, now I can see the arguments being, well, okay, we've had a second wave, we've had a third wave, but you could have moved design work to Australia. You could in fact have put a workforce into a bubble. You could have done all sorts of things which people didn't actually think about um, a while ago. So there and those risks, because they really go to time, I think uh, uh, to a very large extent are dumped onto the contractors because it's going to be the contractor's obligation to manage and implement those sorts of um, public health tools. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Fernando, just if I can bring you in here, and I'm sorry to keep you, keep you waiting, but obviously David talks about those risks in terms of the delay analysis that I touch upon. Um, how, how, from an international point of view, then, if we look at the, the COVID in the context of the international um, construction market, how, how do those new risks, how should they be approached when pricing projects, and, and how do parties to a contract deal with these negotiations in the pre-contract stage, if, if these are issues which are yet to be understood and yet to be interpreted. Um, and, and then obviously the second part of that question, and David touched on it there in terms of um, design being carried out in different jurisdictions, different areas, different countries. What, what are the implications for global projects in light of resources and restrictions on movements of goods and people? And how real is all of this? I think it's very real, but before I go on, I just want to say again, like similar to David, thank you though for, for giving me the opportunity to be able to come and, and have this conversation with, with you and, and, and David. It's a, it's a big pleasure to, to be able to share this platform with you and to be able to discuss these issues. Um, I know we have a, a large audience at the moment, uh, not, not in a particular jurisdiction. So some of the things I'm going to say today will relate to the jurisdiction I'm in, but will be applicable everywhere else. Uh, but getting to your, to your questions, um, I think the, 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 these risks are now anticipated and I think they need to be priced in uh, moving forward because it, it's something that's not gonna be out of a big mystery anymore moving forward. And, and again, like David said, the risk is gonna be put on the contractor to be able to uh, uh, account for any of these second or third waves, fourth or fifth, even 10th wave of COVID, which it's not, it's not unreasonable, right? It is gonna happen. We've seen this from other pandemics in the past uh, where we have these second or third or fourth or fifth waves. Uh, now, how, how extent are they and how much of an impact that would be on a construction project? Uh, that, I mean, that, that would have to be considered with how the project is being 
uh, managed, as well as what what regulations and and other 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 uh, uh, restrictions are being put on the project now, um, and that and of course the contractors' experience in that market too, right? We we they they understand the 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 the, the, the restrictions that have been put on them already as a result of this first and second wave. So we would only the contractor would only expect for that to happen again moving forward. Uh, so I think I think when pricing projects now, all this needs to be be taken care of. And what I mean by that, I mean transportation for for laborers, accommodation for laborers, uh, the density, the the, the 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 separation between them when you're when they're being transported and provided housing, uh, the the amount of PPE that's required on a project. Uh, uh, while they're while they're working and then while they're not working, uh, the additional staff that's required not only to clean but also to to support uh, the laborers and and the construction project in in managing any kind of outbreaks that might occur. And I mean I can go on and on and on here, but uh, but that that kind of covers the point. I, I think I think a lot of it will be governed, a lot of it will be guided by the actual rules and regulations that are that are being applied to on the project. And I think I think it's 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 no longer something that's going to be unforeseeable it's something that is foreseeable and contractors have to price that in moving forward at least for the initial few at least next couple of years at least yeah absolutely so if if we david if if i bring you back and we take this a step further and obviously um under the ambit of successful major of successful force majeure claims um contracts have normally been allowed to recover time um, and avoid the application of damages Um, but if there's obviously the recovery of costs has been prohibited and we've seen an increase in of late really sequestration or liquidation of many contractors internationally for, for a contractor how can how can how can they focus on the recovery of um covid claims in the future i mean is is, is there a route through this as this as this manifests itself in the second and third phases I think you're on mute, David. I'm sorry, I win the mute prize for the first time this morning. Um, <laughs> um, for it's not a straight, it's not straightforward as Fernando identifies. Some of this is going to be priced um, into uh, contracts. Um, that really will only deal with contracts which proceed, but subject to. Um, increased costs because of uh, the existence and the risk of COVID and pandemics. So uh, increased worker spacing, all those costs. You're really talking about a project that's, that's going ahead, notwithstanding the fact that we, we're, we're in a, 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 a pandemic context. Um, the issue is going to be recovering monies for force majeure. Some forms allow the recovery of cost that relates to the force majeure event. Um, and uh, Finnick Red Book does, for example, 2017 Red Book does, but it is in relation to the event itself. So insofar as there are costs incurred in relation to demobilization, that kind of thing, um, because a site is closed, that may be recovered. Um, thereafter, what you find is, is, is for a contractor to recover any sort of cost or payment um, very often involves termination. Um, you do get provisions that either the owner or the contractor can terminate um, if an event of force majeure proceeds for long enough. Uh, And I can see some contractors reaching the view that, in fact, the only way to make themselves financially whole um, is to terminate, alleging that it's it's because of the uh, continuation of the force majeure event um, and trying to make themselves whole in in that fashion. Um, but obviously that isn't going to help, or at least protecting themselves in that fashion, but that isn't going to help in circumstances where, as you identify, the extension of time excuses them uh, for uh, where the project gets back on is reinstated, um, where the extension of time simply excuses them from liquidated damages, um, but doesn't give them cost uh, in relation to the uh, sort of delayed overall delay to the to the to the to the contract so i think it's going to be very difficult and i I suspect that what you'll see is is um negotiated uh provisions uh in terms of 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 extended cost uh increased cost 
uh, with contractors saying, look, if that's not the case, then you'll force us into a position where um, it's really problematic for all of us and we end up terminating. Mm. But that's that I suspect it's, it's going to be it's going to be negotiation against that difficult context. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is difficult because, you know, obviously lots of lots of practitioners and um, commentators talk about, you know, the race to the bottom because people will price cheaper to win the work and people won't go hard enough to get their money back. And, and you know, the real risk of liquidation has to be faced as, as by projects as a whole. So I do, I do agree that negotiation does help and the sharing of risk, as, as we've spoke about before, um, does help because, you know, th there is no infinite pot in, in terms of money that contractors tend to have. And to some extent, in terms of in terms of what projects tend to have, um, Fernando, if I could just come back to funding and arbitrations, etc. We've seen a rise in, in funding and arbitrations, and we've definitely seen a rise um, in that prior to the COVID situation. Um, and ordinarily, the, the costs of arbitration aren't always um, factored into a contractor's balance sheet. Some some quite savvy, and some may include, but some don't. And some obviously look to the developing area of arbitration funded um yes and it had grown but where, where do we sit now with it is it still possible to get funding to re to resolve a dispute that it has its very crux in uncertain COVID-19 issues which is all the debate that we talk about here yeah it it, it is possible uh however I, I will say that uh, I think it's actually become more difficult in the sense that the funders have become a little bit more selective uh in terms of the claims that decide the, the fund um, you know, the conversations I've had and some of the funders I work with here locally, they've all, they've all said that, that they've been indignated with, with claims more so now than they were before COVID. And, and for them, they do, some, some funders will brag that they have a large part of money that they're just waiting to spend. They're looking to spend, but they're, they're not spending that money. I mean, before the COVID, they would only fund maybe one to 10 cases that they would receive by 90%, about 9% or, or 10% of the cases that they receive. Now, I, you know, they, they, they're getting such more cases that they're, they're, they're putting their money where the, the sure claim is, right? Where they, they are almost guaranteed that they're gonna get the money and they're, they're waiting for anything that might come through the door that will give them that, that, that return, that, that pro almost a guarantee of their money getting back uh, if they fund the case. Um, I think I've seen a few funders actually reject claims that they would probably would have accepted beforehand uh, and it's because of this large number of claims that are coming through the door. Um, so yeah, so it is still possible, but I think it, it, uh, the, way, the way the funders will look at COVID-related uh, issues, especially with uh, a rising with delay, um, I think the analysis is still the same. It's, still, it's, not, it's not the main thing that they focus on in terms of whether they're, they're going to fund a case or not. They're looking more at that, uh, I think we had this conversation before, that first basket, second basket, third basket. They're looking more at that first basket of claims where, where it's guaranteed money to the contractor. And what I mean by that, I'm talking about uh, certified payments, retention, uh, agreed variations. That, 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 that is almost a guaranteed money in the, in, in the pockets of the contractor. And they'll, they'll look at that first basket and then make a decision whether to, to fund it and to also what kind of percentage they're going to apply or terms that they're going to apply to any kind of funding agreement with that contractor. The rest... Any delay announced, any delay claims, uh, prolongation, disruption, acceleration will also fall. Well, they'll, they'll take those in consideration, but it won't be the number one thing that they'll look at. And I, I, I suspect that they're looking at these issues the same uh, with COVID. Um, and they put it in that second basket, maybe even third basket. And uh, yeah, so just, I know I've said a lot there, but uh, to answer your question, yes, I think it's still possible. But there, there needs to be some creativity, though, when you propose these, uh, these, when you ask for a funder to fund your case, and I think that's where, where, where sometimes the the, the claim that's presented to the funder fails, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't apply to just any law firm that that submits a request or or a company that submits a request to a funder to fund. I think it, it there there needs to be some creativity sometimes to be able to get a fund, be able to get a claim funded or over the line with a funder. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think an important point for me, obviously, in terms of um, working in delay and quantum in the area of expertise, obviously, um, the recovery of costs is at the forefront of the employer, subcontractor, contractor, subcontractor relationship and the solvency. And, and whilst, you know, time is obviously comforting in terms of 
in terms of the um, alleviation of damages, etc. It doesn't always ensure solvency and sometimes it can actually place you in a, in a more difficult position. So money is pivotal to solvency. Um, and, and David, if I can just come back to, to delay here now and just pick up on the point that um, Fernando makes there. Obviously, in order to avoid the application of prevention principle and contracts that include extension of time clauses, I expect that many contractors and subcontractors will be faced with the immediate response of that was foreseeable um, and productivity levels have increased therefore because of the COVID situation. Whereas what we're saying is that productivity is reduced because of the COVID situation. We've, we've lost money. We've been disruptive. We've been product. We've been less productivity productive, and we want the money paying for that. But, but where does this put delay analysis now in terms of and being selfish now from, from your point of view, you are, um, Queen's Council, you are accustomed to cross-examining and examining. Where, where does this put delay analysis? Is it more complex? Is it, you know, are, are you are you really happy now that in defending claims that you you, you have um, open season on experts or how, where do you sit with it? We always work collaboratively with experts, both tendered by our own party and on the other side, because their duty is to the tribunal, which you will, of course, realise. Absolutely. Um, and it's never open season on experts, except when it is. Um, uh, look, COVID and the uh, issues around frustration um, are going to be a further complicating factor that simply as a matter of um, fact hasn't uh, come into construction claims previously. Um, force majeure has arisen, force majeure issues do arise, but historically they've arisen to a, a, a smaller degree and they've been riots, strikes, that kind of thing. And they can be, they can be factored in. If you get a strike, you can say, look, um, there's a strike, it's in the force majeure provision or it's in the exceptional circumstances provision. Um, we can deal with that. Uh, and it's tended to be two, three, four days a week, two weeks um, in, in relation to a project. And you can deal with that um, as a question of fact. Um, extension of time and delay is a question of fact. There's a long and distinguished line of, of authorities um, from Humphrey Lloyd in the Official Referees Court down most recently to, to, to the High Court in New South Wales uh, saying, look, delay is actually an extension of time. And what you help us do as an expert um, is weighed through a lot of evidence and analysis. And some people get too caught up with programs and delay analyses and methods, but it is fundamentally getting our arms around a lot of complex uh, factual evidence and causation. Um, and so what we're dealing with now is going to be, um, is going to make uh, delay analysis more complex simply because the facts and matters on which the analysis is going to be, to which the analysis is going to be applied will be more complex. We have been familiar with um, delay analysis arising from variations failure to give instructions, those sorts of, of, of matters, productivity, reduced productivity, those sorts of issues, which are essentially um, matters which are intrinsic to the operation of the construction contract. And that is, uh, that is I think, the meat and drink of any delay, uh, delay expert in the construction field. What you're going to have to deal with uh, in the next few years is saying, well, all right, we've got COVID, we've got a pandemic. That has caused certain external events to happen. The fact that there's virus out there doesn't in and of itself affect the progress of a construction contract. Um, what affects the uh, construction contract is the steps taken by governments and others to deal with the public health consequences of the pandemic. It's going to be necessary then to tease those out and say, well, insofar as you would have been doing X, Y and Z in a construction contract, that's been affected by these external issues. Those external issues are unfamiliar to us, so there'll be a degree of complication there. Uh, and the other problem that we're going to have is um, we're not going to be dealing with, if you like, a clean sheet. I, I used the example earlier on of, of moving design work to Australia. Um, 
historically, no pandemic. Yes, you could do your design work anywhere, but it would be as a contractor or as a, you know, if you're on a, 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 a uh, design and build type contract, where is your design capability? So that's fine. You can discuss that. And that's what you were used to. You're now going to have to analyze the additional factor. Should you, in circumstances where your design capability was in India, actually have gone to the expense of moving your design capability to Australia because of different public health measures. That's going to complicate things, I think. Yeah, you make some real valid points. And I think um, one of the issues that rise, arises from that, and maybe I'll bring Fernando back on this, is obviously when, when we look at the existence and the interpretation of the words beyond the contractor's reasonable control, um, I mean, obviously we, we don't know all the impacts of COVID yet. We, we know some because we've felt them, et cetera. Um, but but in that, that phrase or that term or those contract words may be now used as a sweep up for all COVID impacts that everything was something that we should have been aware of. And it was, beyond, it was within our control because we knew about COVID. But, you know, to, to avoid the Rumsfeld um, paradox, we, you know, we don't know what we don't know at this point in time. So, so, so where do we sit with contracts and that, sh that strict interpretation of, you know, um, issues beyond the contractor's reasonable control? Where do we sit with that and, and, and actual claims in respect to the delay and quantum issues arising? So, yeah, so I, I, I think, uh, I mean, we were having a conversation before on this, that uh, it, it will always be used as a sweep up, right? Uh, uh, we, we don't know the full effect of, of, uh, of COVID. Uh, the actual virus is one thing, but what happens around that virus, right? What, what economic impact uh, the COVID uh, uh, brings with that globally, where I think we're starting to see some of that now. And that can also be interpreted as, as beyond the contractor's control, I think. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you guys earlier, where one of the situations I have currently is where the employer is now facing financial difficulties and how to suspend the project. Um, you know, where, where does that leave the subcontractor and main contractor, right? Are they, is, is, it, is it because of these employer difficulties? Is that a reason beyond the party's control? You know, there, there's, there's, there's jurisprudence here in the UAE that says that, that, that it is an event that can be related to that. And, and, and it wasn't something that the, the subcontractor was impacted with directly by the, the COVID virus. It was more of just the, the effect of what pressures the COVID uh, uh, lockdown and, and all the other, other economic issues that are related to COVID has, has made, has brought upon certain employers uh, uh, in terms of financing projects. Um, you know, that, that, that is an example of that. But, but crafty lawyers like myself and David, of course, will always find ways to use this, this term or this phrase in, in the in any contract. Oh. Given the fact that we're in this, this post, uh, I guess, I guess you could say post COVID, right? Uh, uh, phase of, of, uh, of, uh, of yeah, COVID. Yeah, I think, um... And what, what's obviously important now then for, for contractors and employers, et cetera, um, is that when you look at delay analysis now, then obviously you're addressing the, interpre the interpretation of what should reasonably be considered, et cetera, by actually demonstrating that you addressed it as a foreseeable COVID issue in your program. Where, where you don't do that, and it obviously extends through subsequent phases, it, it may follow that we have to apply with strict regard and strict um, nature in terms and the actual particular words of the of the contract itself in terms of that. So the focus for someone like me in terms of delay and the various COVID phases and not knowing what we don't, what not knowing what impacts that we're not aware of at this point in time and demonstrating the ones that we can demonstrate. Where, where, do, we, where do we sit with these, David, in terms of how these claims are addressed in the, in the ambit of the contract and the force majeure and the reasonable and the foreseeability approach. I mean, is that a good approach to be taken or, or is it just fraught with, with more issues that are going to arise? You've won the second prize for mute as well. Keeps winning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm English counsel, so I'm, I'm, I'm basically baffled by technology. Um, <laughs> The, um, I think the issue of, 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 of subsequent phases is going to be, really falls into the, into the question, uh, which, which was with us before, of what is the programming effect of an event of force majeure? 
um, the one I always teach my uh, LLM students um, is an event of force majeure under a fitting form of contract, uh, which was a tropical storm. The tropical storm lasted for two days. Um, clearing up the mess that it made to a, a desalination plant in South India um, took nine months. Was the extension of time two days or was the extension of time nine months? Um, and I think these sort of knock-on effects to, uh, uh, as you say, other phases in, 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 in contracts um, and other phases of COVID, those are two slightly different issues. In so far as COVID at the moment has, 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 has affected one phase, there is the classic problem of, of claiming any extension of time of saying, here's the event, but actually at the moment, we don't know what the, what the knock-on um, consequence of that uh, is. And the big fight is going to be, did the contractor suitably mitigate the effect um, or not as time, as time went on? Um, the further we get away from COVID, the more it's going to be said, well, you should have actually started to mitigate matters. Um, and then the, 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 the other issues are going to be, uh, the, the sort of distinct issue is going to be dealing with subsequent phases of COVID. Um, and there the argument is going to be, look, it, what I said at the beginning, we didn't have any expertise with, with the first wave of COVID or phase of COVID, so we didn't know what to do. But in, as soon as it became apparent that we were having a second wave or a third wave, you should have been able to deal with that because you should have known already how to, how to respond to that. And that will actually apply even to pre-COVID um, contracts, because although it will be said that the second and third phase was not anticipated at the time the contract was entered into, fair enough, um, contractors always have a, 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 an obligation to, to mitigate uh, the effects of any event of force majeure. Um, and so one of the problems we're going to have is, is, is teasing out as this goes on in subsequent phases, and they, it may split out nicely into different phases of different building contracts. Um, the extent to which, in fact, there were techniques known and available to mitigate the effect of subsequent waves of, 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 of COVID. And I, and I think you may have to distinguish, you may have to say, look, when, 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 when your workforce was restricted in its movement in May 2020, that had this effect when your workforce was restricted in its movements in February 2021, you knew you had these techniques available to you to mitigate. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, if, if I can bring you back now, Fernando, just and just talk about, obviously, the issue that I raised there with David and the, you know, the, the imponderable situation that you may find yourself in, but obviously you have to find the route through as well. Um, obviously, funders and third parties are reacting to to this continuing change and the continuing change that we talk about. Um, and, and, and clearly it's an aspect of dispute resolution at the moment, which is not particularly supported by multiple authorities. Um, and that's to say that, you know, we've not had a major case yet in terms of phase two or phase three, et cetera. Um, but when, when we talk about liquidated damages and extension of time clauses, and when we construe them strictly as contra preferentum, when considering this on an international basis with joint ventures from different jurisdictions. Are the issues consistent or varied on the international plane? And how does that sit with funding? Well, it's been my experience with those, those type of clauses that I've seen so far. I mean, I don't, I don't have a wide range uh, experience uh, around the world with, with these type of provisions, but what I've seen though in, in, in throughout the Middle East and Africa and parts of Asia, um, that, that they haven't been consistent, they're, they're different. Um, the way they're, they're drafted are different and how they're applied are different. Uh, uh, especially here in the region, everything is amended most of the time. And these, these clauses are, are usually amended uh, or the first ones to be amended. Uh, so how, how funders look at that, I mean, it's still the same, 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 my, same, my, same analysis that, was, that I mentioned earlier. Um, they, they, do, they don't consider these initially. It's, it's something that's considered secondary. Uh, and again, they look at the at the at the key key damages that are 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 easily to get for a funder and for a contractor if they bring an arbitration. Okay. Okay. I suppose it, it that renders the question then in terms of um, delay events running at the same time. And David, it wouldn't be wouldn't be a proper engagement with a a British council uh, without talking. <laughs> so. 
now when we look at the second and third phases of COVID, um, and in, we look at them in respect of concurrent delays, but the COVID delays at the same time as an employer traditional event. Firstly, did the same rules of law apply? Um, and wouldn't it, and this is, you know, this is a, a question that I would ask if I was in the audience, wouldn't it be the case that the, the COVID-19 delays are, are always the potent and dominant delays because of the issues in terms of health and safety and regulation, et cetera? Um, first of all, I think the same issues will apply. The same principles of law will apply. Um, an exceptional event under the FIDIC form entitles a contractor to an extension of time. But that is because the exceptional event has caused delay to the progress of, of the works because of uh, suspension. Um, and so the question will be, what is the delay that results from the suspension? So, for example, if there is, if, if someone can point to an exceptional event, but there's been no suspension of the works, then no extension of time. Um, the question is then going to be, what is the delay caused by the suspension of the works? Uh, and that is going to be a question for you in exactly the same way <clears throat> as any other delay. Um, then turning to, 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 co uh, to concurrent delay, um, I think the same principles will apply. There may be a tendency, and I think this may be a trap that contractors could fall into. Um, there may be a tendency to say, oh, there was COVID, so we're off the hook. Um, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, and for example, uh, if, you, if you look at a delay to a project, again, uh, on, a, on a contractor's design basis, um, it may well be said, well, contract is now six months late. Um, of those 180 days, if you want to do it on a day, day basis, <clears throat> of those 180 days, um, yes, there was COVID. Um, but actually, when you tease out the delay and, and those 180 days, um, 60 days of those were design based. Um, 120 days were work on site and uh, execution based. Um, if then you're saying that at that point, what you're going to do under any force majeure clause is tease out what was actually affected by the force majeure. And if you end up saying, uh, execution on site was delayed because yes, there were there were uh, civil restrictions on people going to site. But actually, your design work is somewhere else where it wasn't affected. Different country where it wasn't affected by by by, by COVID, um, which is entirely possible given the different regulations around the world. You may be facing the position of saying, "Well, all right, there was COVID, uh, but that gives you 180 days because 120 days because of what that did to execution of works on site." It doesn't give you the other 60 days because the design work could have continued, even though there was COVID, because of the effect that COVID had on design work or didn't have. Absolutely. Just if, if we go back to that then, Fernando, in terms of the, the commercial aspects of finding yourself in a dispute or an international arbitration and you are um, across borders, joint ventures, etc., and the different context in terms of the jurisdictional challenges that they have that David talks to there. What, what, what do you do in respect of, or what can you do in respect of securing payments during these disputes and the arbitrations? What, what is your process? Oof. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of questions. Difficult question to ask because everybody wants to know that, you know, I'm owed hundred million, I want to have security against it, but where do you sit with these cross-border um, different jurisdictional challenges? Yeah, I mean that—that's the challenge, right? Uh, each each jurisdiction is different. Um, uh, I mean, the advice I would provide is that I would just I would really recommend that the jurisdiction you're entered into, you're in, to look at what remedies or what what opportunities you have to be able to apply pressure um, on the counterparty to be able to you know get them to the table to settle with you, or or you know be very very blunt against them and and then, and get them. Get them, uh, get them to settle with you ASAP, or, or at least maybe force them to, to 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 pay up immediately before you actually go to to an arbitration. And just quickly, one little tactic we use here, just to give an, an example, is going into the courts and, and asking for an attachment on assets for the fear that you're that the 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 main contractor or the employer might go into bankruptcy or might flee the the, the jurisdiction. 
I mean, things like that. And I know, no, no, that doesn't apply to every single jurisdiction, but there, there are other remedies out there that you can look at. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, mediation. Uh, I know some of the, the arbitration centers offer mediation services, but here in Dubai, for example, uh, the Dubai Chamber has its own mediation uh, uh, program. And it's something I, I, I talk about highly to anyone I can, because it not only applies to a company that's set up here, but if you're in contract with that company, and that company is operating in London or operating in Europe or in the States or even Africa, you can come, you party, counterparty who's in Europe can come to Dubai and ask for mediation services to, 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 be, to be commenced. And, and the reason why I build this one up is because Dubai Arbitration Center actually has teeth uh, against that, that local entity, even the other entity that's in the other state, in the other country, um, in the sense that they will actually request the other party where that party is set up to, pry, to, to apply some kind of either restriction on trading or, or, or uh, uh, force that other party to come to mediation if, if not these type of things would, would, be, would be requested to be implemented against it. Um, I think it's an effective tool and, it's, and if you actually go on our website, they have a little cute video where they said that they've, you know, they've intervened in, in uh, disputes between parties that are outside of the UAE and actually had, uh, had, had good results in terms of uh, reaching an amicable settlement between before actually going to arbitration or litigation. So that's just one example. It may not apply to everybody who's on, on the, online at the moment, but there are remedies out there. And I know we've talked highly also about funding. You know, there are funders out there that will pay for, for these type of remedies, uh, or at least try to, try to make an attempt to, to be able to set a, settle the case early without you, without the company or corporate requiring uh, to spend any of that money to pay for, for you, Damien, to, to prepare their claims or, or for, for us lawyers to, to pay for us to, to, to negotiate on their behalf. Um, so there, there are, are ways out there. It's just being creative and, and, being a, and being aggressive too with your counsel, right? With your lawyers, forcing them to, to make, to, to find something, right? To, to come up with a, a creative resolution, a res strategy to be able to resolve your dispute instead of just going straight to arbitration or, or litigation. Um, I, I think there's there's a lot of options out there if if you look. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, you know you can avoid the Armageddon of arbitration and all the costs of it if you just apply yourself to it. And you know, like you say, and you, you do need to show some teeth at some point, and you know, and be be capable of going to the court and, and seeking attachment if that's if that's the very last measure that you have to engage in. Um, I, one think, of, one of the other... I think the um, I think I think the the other point about securing payment, however, is, is and you might say this is almost anti-mediation. Um, it's it, it, probably no surprise to a lot of people on this call, but there's a lot of work going on at the moment ar around advising on performance and on-demand bonds. And uh, I, I think one of the things we're going to see is um, engineers and people rejecting applications for extensions of time um, where, where they feel that they have proper grounds to, um, I hope. Uh, and 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 owners in particular who will have the benefit of bonds, I'm afraid, will be caught. Will, will call them and are calling them, um, so that they actually are holding the cash before they get to a mediation or an arbitration. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we don't want to do ourselves out of any work anyway. So I mean, you know, so we want to want to want to keep the debate going, I guess. Um, just just one other question. Obviously, we touched on concurrency and in the same in the same theme of delaying quantum, obviously, in terms of, in terms of time bars, I know we, we've talked about impacts that we know of, impacts that we don't know of. In, in terms of those impacts that, you know, we, we find out at a date which we possibly find ourselves in a time bar situation, where, where do we sit with those type of events? When it's very difficult to, you know, we know the impacts that we must include. There's an impact that happens that we're not quite aware of, and we've got the challenge of the date when we do become aware, et cetera. But where, do we, where will we sit with time Time bar, and is this going to be a further challenge in respect of not notifying our our employers and contractors alike? Um, I think that will depend. The, the, the effect of time bars in co in the contract depends on um, on the applicable law. Yeah. Um, I think you'll. F I mean, in the UAE, there's a quite a significant degree of skepticism um, in relation to those sorts of time bars. Uh, they're sometimes given more effect in, in, in other jurisdictions. But I think that there's a trap and there's a sympathy. The trap is going to be contractors who have simply failed to notify COVID as an event. Um, I think they're 
hopefully not because it's been mentioned on so many webinars by now, but a lot of people will wander around and think, well, everyone knows that there is COVID and everyone knows that the site has been shut by this event or that event or, or, or whatever public health issue. Um, that's the trap. Um, where there are notifications and ongoing notifications, I, I think that there is going to be a high degree of sympathy, as there frequently is, in fact, um, on the part of tribunals uh, to find ways around time bar defences um, where a contractor has notified the event, um, being COVID, COVID's happened, this has happened, we can't get people on site, and we'll tell you what the, what the outcome is whenever, Beca particularly because it's an external, it's an external event, um, I think there's going to be a lot of sympathy. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good answer. I think that, that helps a lot of people, I think, really, in terms of the challenges of it. Um, just before we move on and, and see if we have any questions, and obviously it's a question probably for the two of you then. I mean, I'm, I'm no intention of taking work away from any of us. And obviously we, we're focusing on the issues because the, the common issues that we know in terms of disputes and arbitrations and expert work, etc. But if we look at COVID and force majeure and all these issues that we talk about and the issues of foreseeability and the future challenges and the impacts that are going to disrupt, isn't it, isn't it time that we move towards a more um, collaborative approach and proper apportionment and ownership of risks in contracts? And, and I mean, that's, that's my first question. The second part of that is, is how can that be equitable? How can that be reasonable between two, two parties entering into a contract? <laughs> uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice to dream, right? Um, uh, move uh depending on the jurisdiction right i think uh i think there might be some good that comes out of this and i think i think there might be some more reasonable thought processing going on when these parties do enter in the contract and i think i think i think you might see something like that happen uh, i don't know how you feel about this david um i think you have to bear in mind when you're talking about the allocation of risks projects have to be bankable um, and Frank, because everything is done on a project finance basis that we're, that we're talking about. Um, and if there is too much uncertainty, um, the bankers simply won't fund it. And so the problem with what you would suggest, uh, understandably, uh, in terms of collaboration and equitable apportionment of risks, is you start to get to a point where, where, where the funders can't work out what their exposure is. Um, on a on a project, unfortunately, um, so we're never going to get away from construction contracts as risk allocation. That's what they are. Um, but I think that there may be um, an appreciation after COVID because it's been so widespread that actually forcing your counterparty to the wall or to the brink doesn't work because if everyone's doing it, then in fact stuff just doesn't get built. Um, and the one thing that, that, that doesn't work in project finance uh, context um, is an asset that isn't completed and doesn't produce an income stream. Um, so that's a, that's a difference in behavior. And that goes back actually to Fernando's point about mediation um, a, a, as a solution to a lot of these things. But ultimately, we've got to allocate risk because that's the only way you can fund things. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to see if, we, if the audience has any questions. I mean, it's an it's been it's been a pleasure for me to listen to you both and obviously a learning experience once again just talking with you um just see whether we have any questions in the, in the actual chat box uh okay this is from a chap called peter stander how would a contractor claim entitlement to cost to a direct subcontractor to employ a delayed a milestone which the contractor is relying on this is a result of direct subcontractors force majeure claim but has consequential effect on the contractor's work so I'm careful of you. Careful of you giving any um, free advice, but I think it's quite a good question. <laughs> if one of you could pick it up on it from a legal aspect, um, I think what this picks up very nicely um, on Peter's part is uh, what I sometimes think of as the as, as as the break in force majeure liability or force majeure um, protection, uh, because the second part it's a result of so it's a delay to a, a milestone, which is a result of a subcontractor's force majeure claim 
um, but where the subcontractor appears in fact to be retained by the employer and not by the contractor. And so what you've got there is, the question there is, what, does, what is the owner's protection in fact? Is this an event of force majeure that the owner can argue? Quite possibly not. Um, the owner, if the owner simply hasn't delivered something that the owner is required to under the main contract, um, then in fact the contractor in that circumstance would be entitled to um, extension of time, cost, profit, um, because of the owner's breach. Um, if in fact what's happened is that this is a force majeure event that's occurred elsewhere in the contract and hasn't uh, itself prevented performance by the, um, by, the, by, 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 the, by the contractor. As I say, this, what you're starting to look at here is um, where, where, where force majeure affects one bit of a contract network or a contract chain and not another bit. And ultimately somebody gets left carrying that risk. Mm. Who's yeah. the best? The best person to carry the risk in those situations? Um, in the circumstance that, that I think Peter has identified, it probably is the employer. It's certainly the employer rather than the contractor because the contractor has um, no ability to manage that delay or that risk because, for example, the contractor in those circumstances wouldn't be able to go away and get the work done by somebody else because you'd have to postulate that, in fact, although they're they, they are they are necessary for the contractor's works. Um, they don't form part of the contractor's scope of work. Okay. Fernando, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, no, I was just going to add to, I mean, also what plays into this is also the wording of the contract as well as the applicable law to the contract. This will also will, will impact the contractor's claim for entitlement. Um, I just wanted to also just clear, just make that clear as well. Um, I mean, we, we we don't know what the terms are, so it's difficult to, to actually give a better answer to this question, but I just wanted to just mention that as part of the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I suppose the, the issue here is that if there were um, multiple subcontractors with the same issues and they were all um, directly engaged by the employer and affecting the contractor, then the poor old contractor is in a very, very unfortunate position and the employer has to accept the risk. So you know, whether it's one or it's 10, I think the, the employer is probably best placed to accept the risk and manage the risk. On that basis, um, is there any any further questions from the audience? Anybody would like to come on the mic and ask a question to our uh, esteemed guests? Okay. Um, well, maybe if I just ask one final question, um, and. You can both come in on it if you don't if you don't mind. Just in terms of the context of international arbitrations, potential arbitrations, risk analysis. Um, what what do you think the wider implications are now in respect of projects and their risk analysis as a whole? Their potential into dispute is the as the risk increase is the is the decision to build more challengeable now because of this whole situation and all these continuance of imponderables that we're not quite sure of yet or is the law is the law stronger and more protective for employers contractors and subcontractors has it developed anymore i don't know if you want to take this one david but i'll i'll start then uh, i think i think in terms of the, the the situation we're in today um one thing that i know it was briefly mentioned before and i didn't really talk about too much and i should have is just the enforceability aspect to this, right? What, what's the status of the other counterparty and whether if it's even wise to even convince an arbitration, um, uh, even if you have these claims against the counterparty, if that party is either uh, on the brink of ba bankruptcy or it's gone into bankruptcy. I mean, we've, we haven't noticed in the news lately, but we've had uh, you know Arab tech go down and there is grumblings of other major uh, uh, contractors here in the Middle East that will also potentially go down. Um, um, and, you know, there's, there's real conversations uh, about whether, uh, you know, what, what is a subcontractor to do when, when now knowing that this potential risk might come um, and then all this is coming as, as an effect of COVID-19. 
so the, the, that's something that should be really be focused on at least at least considered um, uh, before actually committing the iron arbitration moving forward. Yeah, I think that's, <clears throat> I think though that whole question of cash flow as we move into 2021, 2022 will be very important. And you'll see people looking for ways to protect their cash flow, spend work. Uh, I haven't mentioned statutory adjudication in the United Kingdom, but those sorts of cash flow protection measures will become very important to people. Um, and I suspect you'll have, have uh, contractors and subcontractors looking for the ability to suspend works, that sort of thing, if there is a failure to pay them. To protect their own, to protect their own cash flow, um, so I, th I think you will see that sort of balancing of of of, of, of risk with, with people becoming, if they can, much more protective of their of their cash flow. Um, I think I've just I've just also noticed that the, the, a further question that we've had in the chat box from um, Mohammed, um, asking really the sort of question that that I think. Um, is taxing all of us at the moment, which is um, in, uh, submitting interim COVID-19 claims. That's an interesting term in itself, actually, that, that, that we can understand exactly what that is. Claiming lost time due to social distancing measures, which the engineer has rejected by saying there's no proper substantiation. Inviting the consultant to estimates of productivity um, because of instructions. Um, but that there are also delays by the contractor. And I think uh, that really goes to um, the management, both of the project on site and uh, the sorts of issues, uh, Damien, that, 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 that you get involved with before people ever talk to Fernando, let alone me. Um, yes. I'm right to the end of this trail, which is um, really going to be the issue. This is not a force majeure, or, or, or at least... The interesting thing is this isn't the suspension of the works, um, which is one of the things that force majeure contemplates. Um, this is the impairment of the works. Um, now, the impairment of the works, you may, in fact, uh, be able to deal with under um, uh, change of law provisions or, or, or similar provisions. But actually, that sort of how we quite put in that impairment of the works, um, we're going to need to use change of law compliance with regulations, that sort of analysis, which is a slightly different analysis to force majeure um, in a lot of contracts. Some contracts don't deal with it as well as, as, as they do with, with force majeure. And, but the, the, the sort of factual issue that Mohammed is dealing with is precisely the kind of thing where, you know, Fernando, from the law firm perspective and you as the expert, as the expert um, have to spend a lot of time focusing on uh, because they're not straightforward issues. Um, when there is both an impairment in the pace of the work, in the speed of the work, and contractors delayed. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you know, obviously I've spent some time looking at this over, <laughs> over the last nine months in various different guises, and we sort of, you know, we, we almost come back to the, a measured mile principle, but in, using the measured mile, you have to be very careful implementing it because of the the unimpacted and the impacted position and how comparable they are and getting to true comparisons etc um so it so it is a real challenge um and it also depends on the type of work as well when you have multiple um, activities within an area of completion or sequence then it's very very difficult to look at the productivity of which one's being affected the most if you've got sort of fairly straightforward um issues such as maybe concrete slabs or something like that and and for those who, who know the history of the measured mile, it's, it, it comes back from the American dispute boards. And if Mohammed wanted to look at a case, it, it, I think it's, it's Clark concrete versus the, 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 um, the federal government in the US. And it's, it's the change in the concrete in to the US federal buildings after the Oklahoma bombing. And what the dispute board there said that there was a clear um, correlation between the productivity that ought to have been achieved and the productivity that was affected thereafter. But where that falls away on, on you know, one issue or a small minor issue or a, a, ma a major issue, then that analysis begins to fail. So entering in on measured mile, you've got to be very, very secure that implementing it, you can do it correctly and you can ensure apples with apples all the way through. Um, you know, so it, it, yes, it's a definite challenge there for Mohammed. Um, 
measured mile does offer you some some approach to it, but I'd be very, very careful about using it as a scientific approach to, to determine your position. Okay, um, I, don't, I don't think we have any more questions. So um, I'd like to say thank you very much to, to David and to Fernando for joining me today. It's been really informative and very helpful and hopefully you've enjoyed it as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.